Thank you uh, for this uh, invitation. And these are my disclosures, and I think the most important disclosure is that this is really a personal view of what has been important in pediatric IBD over the past year. And I'm going to say also that what is important for us could be data that were generated amongst adult patients, uh, but still we need uh, our pediatric perspective. It was a great year for us because we had our fourth international pediatric IBD symposium in this beautiful city of Barcelona, and that was really three days of discussing pediatric IBD with colleagues compared with this forum here where I'm going to try to highlight uh, what's been important in about 20 minutes. Um, I will stay away from uh, diet questions because I notice that that's going to be covered. So you have all seen this issue of gastroenterology, which pointed out that IBD is becoming a global problem. And this was highlighted at our symposium at Barcelona as being an important challenge for all of us. And I wanted to draw your attention to this systematic review which has just been published in The Lancet, in case you haven't seen it, work by Su Ying in Hong Kong and Gil Kaplan in Canada, looking at all the published studies on incidence and prevalence of IBD around the world and with an editorial by Michael Cam. And essentially, looking at all the new data, what seems to be the case is that the incidence is increasing in developing countries, for the most part, remaining fairly stable in the developed world where the incidence increased long ago or in recent years. What's important, though, is in pediatric studies globally, we're still seeing an increase, even if the incidence is stable in adults in these countries. So this is from France and from Canada, Eric Benchamol, who does administrative data analyses there, has shown that the incidence in Canadian adults seems to have leveled off, but the prevalence, of course, is still increasing. But in the youngest children, that's where we're seeing still increasing incidence. So if this is true, what this may mean is that IBD is becoming more of a pediatric disease, so very important for us. I think we all recognize the spectrum of IBD occurring in children, and this is a slide from Dan Turner, which I like very much. And I wanted to point out to you also some other work which Dr. Turner and others in Europe have done. What this is trying to do, really, is bring some consistency to how people apply the labels ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, or IBDU. Now, I think we cannot be sure that this is the right way of applying the level, even, e labels, even if it's now done consistently, because there wasn't really a good gold standard here. Rather, it was how did people at the many participating institutes, how did they apply the label IBDU or Crohn's colitis or ulcerative colitis? But they ended up classifying a lot of things as class one, two, or three features. And granulomata, for example, was considered a class one feature, so that if it was there, you definitely called that Crohn's disease. Not sure that's always true, because we know you can have granulomatous change right in the heart of inflammation that is less significant than a granuloma removed. But anyway, what I like about this is, is trying to uh, make some rules that people would abide by in applying the labels. 
The other thing that has come out of this work, I think by and large IBDU is treated like ulcerative colitis, and there may be some uh, take home messages there uh, to not deprive people of medications, for example, like 5-ASA that have a role in ulcerative colitis, just because you have something that's making you a little concerned, it's not straightforward ulcerative colitis. Very quickly, what's new in the realm of the cause of IBD, and we've always asked, do the causes differ depending on the age of development? And this figure, which I modified uh, to just talk about IBD becoming more pediatric, actually came, as you know, from a manuscript that was talking about monogenic causes of IBD. What I wanted to point out is that the likelihood of IBD being a single gene disorder, a phenocopy of complex IBD, is related to the severity of the phenotype in addition to the age of onset. And extreme phenotypes may be monogenic, Certainly for us, it's important to recognize, but I don't think we should talk about all very early onset IBD, meaning, for example, colitis that develops in a four-year-old as necessarily being a monogenic disorder. It likely represents the fact that for complex IBD, we are seeing it develop at an earlier age. But I think we're doing a better job now of sorting out the monogenic causes. This is a publication from a group, one of several around the world, that can sequence specific genes known to lead to monogenic IBD in a patient where you are suspicious they might have one of these forms, likely because of a combination of very early onset and very difficult to treat disease. We still are so much in the dark about the environmental triggers that lead to complex IBD. This is a nice review in JAMA Pediatrics from Dora Cheval and Paul Rufo. I wanted to draw your attention to something in case you haven't heard of it already. The GEM study, which was initiated in Canada, stands for Gene Environment Microbes. And here what we've been doing over nine years already is enroll healthy people who are at risk because they are either siblings or offspring of people with Crohn's disease. We enroll them, we test a number of things, including the microbes in the stool, their intestinal permeability when they're healthy, their genetics, their antimicrobial serology, and then we follow them with a prediction that a certain number will develop Crohn's. And as of now, the target of over 5,000 has been recruited, and the hypothesis that several would develop Crohn's has been proven. To date, just over 60 have developed Crohn's. So far, we have only published on observations in the healthy cohort. So this was a publication a year ago demonstrating that some of the findings of the microbiome in these healthy but at-risk subjects could be linked to genetics. But what we are set up to do now is examine the nested case control. So in other words, the group that have developed Crohn's versus those that were at risk but have stayed healthy, what is different in those who went on to develop Crohn's. So perhaps this can lead to some risk, pr risk prediction that might lead to a prevention trial. So we have to watch this space. Moving on now, 
other things that we talked about in Barcelona as being major challenges for pediatric IBD are first of all that precision medicine or personalized IBD care is not yet a reality and that current therapies are not effective in all patients, but I would add the subtext that at least in pediatrics, they are effective in many. So I think this is really a landmark pediatric study and publication that was published at the beginning of 2017. And the steering committee for the study are pictured there at the top, and Marla is with us today. So you know what this study did. They enrolled newly diagnosed children and teenagers with Crohn's disease who did not have any complications of their disease luminally at the time of diagnosis. So inflammatory Crohn's at the time they were diagnosed. And then they followed them, or we followed them, I think many of us added patients to this study. Importantly, the management of these patients was at the discretion of the physicians at the 23 centers. So there's no protocol for how you would treat. But you can see that 54 developed stricturing disease and 24 penetrating disease over a three-year period. The remainder, with the therapies that they were given, remained inflammatory. And so when you look at that at the three-year mark, you can see that overall about 10% developed some form of complicating disease. In the top there is the penetrating disease, about 3%, and in the blue, stricturing disease, about uh, 5% over three years. And one of the questions that was able to be addressed was, did early anti-TNF introduction uh, influence the likelihood of developing these complications, the two types, in the three-year follow-up? And to do this, it was a propensity score analysis matching the subjects who received anti-TNF with those who did not. And what was shown was that the use of early anti-TNF therapy prevented the development of penetrating complications, but it didn't seem to have an effect on the likelihood of developing stricturing complications. I think the proviso here is that this is three-year follow-up. It's also, even though the team tried to exclude stricturing disease at presentation, it is possible that there would be some patients who would develop stricturing disease a bit later, and perhaps those would be benefiting from the early anti-TNF. But this is the finding of this study, and you can see when you look in multivariable analyses at what prevents or what is a predictor of penetrating disease, early anti-TNF use is preventive, and you see there also influence of other factors, including serology, but for stricturing disease, anti-TNF therapy didn't seem to influence, but ASCA serology was predictive of developing stricturing disease. I think this is something to think about, whether we should start to more proactively figure that in our uh, algorithms for utilizing one therapy or another. And very noteworthy from this study, we were able to take ileal biopsies and show that there was a difference in the pathways that were represented and which influenced whether you went on to develop stricturing or penetrating disease. So I think this is uh, very novel and the sort of thing that we really want more of to predict what's going to happen to our patients. I just wanted to bring to your attention the fact that for the first time, 
and sponsored by Abvi globally, pediatric people from around the world are getting together to really summarize all the literature existing to know uh, what good predictors there are to rely on to tell us what explains the very variable clinical course that we're all used to. So something to watch again. Now I think for a long time, we as pediatric IBD specialists have changed our goals in treating particularly Crohn's disease, wanting to heal the mucosa. And therefore, this study, which is an adult study and uh, has just been published in The Lancet online, is the first study to prospectively look at in randomized fashion whether adjusting therapy to some objective markers rather than just relying on clinical symptoms improves outcomes. And in this case, the primary outcome was going to be endoscopic healing. So these were adults who were naive to immune modulators or biologics. They were on some prednisone, and then they were randomized to either have their treatment escalated through a predefined sequence of how you would escalate therapy, which was adalidumab, and then from alternate weekly to weekly maintenance, and then adding azathioprine, the same sequence in both groups, but the clinical group only according to clinical symptoms, the tight monitoring group according to symptoms, but also escalating if the calprotectin or the CRP was elevated. So what you see in the, in the course of the study, obviously treatment gets escalated more in the tight control group, more use of adalidumab and more use of weekly adalidumab, but importantly, the primary endpoint, which was mucosal healing, at 48 weeks was more often achieved if you adjusted according to the objective, objective parameters as well as symptoms and other secondary endpoints also superior. These are some uh, papers from pediatric groups looking at fecal calprotectin and I think we do like it as a sort of midway between symptoms and objective looking, something in additional to guide us. In the COM study, they escalated based on a fecal calprotectin above 250. I think most of our pediatric recommendations would be not to intervene just on one value in that range, but to take it into consideration to repeat and to follow. Now, very importantly, and I wanted to finish up with this, at this meeting here so far, and I hope you have been able to attend uh, a lot of the sessions, it seems clear that for our adult colleagues, they already are making a lot of decisions in the column which I have called in the near future here. So our adult colleagues are choosing between anti-TNF biologics and other pathway biologics with a patient who is naive to all biologics. We so far, at least in Canada, are not doing that. So the choices that we have are for the first anti-TNF, and then we do have choices when anti-TNF fails, and, and we have to make decisions there. So you've learned a lot if you've been attending the meetings here, but this is a nice uh, review article about how to make decisions in the expanding therapeutic armamentarium. What I feel is that these new alternate pathway biologics are still on the horizon for us in pediatrics as far as being able to use them as the first anti-TNA, first biologic, but that may change very quickly. And we may very soon be in a situation, as our adult colleagues seem to be, where we're having to make decisions with the first biologic. What I wanted to say was that 
for children, anti-TNFs seem to be highly effective in the treatment of luminal inflammatory Crohn's disease. And I'm not sure if that's because the patients we are treating have shorter duration of disease, but certainly for luminal Crohn's disease, we're almost, or I am almost surprised if the anti-TNF does not work. It's different with ulcerative colitis. I think it's not as reliably effective. And the other thing we have to say is that we have very good safety experience with anti-TNF if thiopurine combination is avoided. And this is during 20 plus years of use. So we shouldn't be too ready, I think, in pediatrics to abandon anti-TNF. This is a very important paper uh, from the beginning of 2017 from the DEVELOP registry showing that in this cohort of 5,000 patients with 24,000 years of follow-up, yes, as a group, they had a higher risk of lymphomas and other malignancies than healthy age match controls, but this was being driven by the use of thiopurines. And you can see here that if you had thiopurines, regardless of whether you had a biologic or not, that was what was bumping you up to have more neoplasia than healthy age-matched controls, whereas anti-TNF alone, we were not seeing that signal. And the details will be in the handouts that will be available, I think, online, or you can read the paper. It wasn't nice to see these uh, malignancies develop, and the predominant ones were lymphoid malignancies. Uh, blue means that the patients were on that at the time the lymphoma developed but you can see listed also the other drugs to which they were exposed. There was one patient who was not exposed to either an immune modulator or a biologic, but the others, with one exception, had all been exposed to thiopurines. It also seemed to be a risk factor for the development of HLH, whereas anti-TNF did not. And I must say also that between the time the manuscript was submitted for publication and the time it was going to appear uh, in print, there were actually two developments of hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma in this cohort, both patients on thiopurines only and not exposed to anti-TNF. So I think this will and has changed practice it's further support that the benefit-risk ratio is more favorable for anti-TNF than thiopurines, and I think is leading to more use of biologics anti-TNF without a trial of uh, thiopurines. We've learned to optimize anti-TNF uh, based on therapeutic drug monitoring. I think this is very important in pediatrics and I'd encourage you uh, to read these two articles. You know, in terms of proactive TDM in maintenance therapies, the uh, studies, the randomized studies have not been that positive, but I think where it may be particularly important is to get the dosing right early during induction, and Marla particularly is pioneering this with her dashboard and the way you try to personalize the dosing according to a number of factors. Almost finished. Uh, I think in ulcerative colitis, it would be nice to have a new pathway biologic. This is a more recent analysis of the Gemini study, not the original publication, but looking particularly at the differences between anti-TNF naive and anti-TNF failure patients. And what we see is that those who had failed anti-TNF, they're harder to treat, but you'll note that the placebo rates are also lower 
in the uh, ones who had failed anti-TNF. So that treatment benefits are similar. So there is benefit in anti-TNF failure patients. The 44% there at week 52 or the 36% clinical remission is a bit deceiving because these were the responders who were re-randomized. So the absolute number is lower than that. It's probably about 25%. One pu new published study in children from the Porto group, and uh, also uh, these were patients uh, who had failed anti-TNF, similar uh, steroid-free remission rate of about 25%. So these, uh, I think I'm going to out of time. Those are, that's my take of uh, the highlights in 2017, but to summarize, IBD incidence is increasing. Why is that? And what can we do to understand and prevent it? I think we've seen the power of pediatric consortia. We've demonstrated that we should objectively monitor treatment effectiveness. I think we should optimize therapies through TDM and do so early. But I think we shouldn't abandon anti-TNF in pediatrics. Maybe that will change in the coming year, but that's uh, for now. Thanks.